Greetings, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. Pastor Sullivan here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Today's question, dear pastor, what do you think about the new perspectives on Paul? Is justification by faith not about faith versus works righteousness and not about how one becomes a Christian? All right, so the new perspectives on Paul, which we'll abbreviate as NPP, it's a scholarly movement uh, whose goal is really to liberate St. Paul's theology from the Reformation Lutheran understanding. The foundational difference between these two readings of St. Paul is the understanding of the historical context. Luther understood first century Judaism to be steeped in legalism and works righteousness so that the Jews believed that they were righteous before God uh, and therefore saved by their works of the law. The NPP, however, thinks that Luther was simply reading the, the works righteousness of the papacy into St. Paul's epistles. The NPP then thinks that first century Judaism wasn't about legalism and works righteousness, but the chief problem was ethnocentrism. The Jews believed that they were God's covenant people by grace, but then that the works of the law uh, were not to earn righteousness, but simply they were external badges that they wore to demonstrate that they were God's covenant people. This then, in at least the estimation of the new perspectives, is the cause of the Gentile problem in the early church. Do the Gentiles need the same badges in order to be seen as God's covenant people? Now, the chasm between the Lutheran understanding of Paul and the NPP only widens from there. Uh, the new perspective needs new definitions of key Pauline terminology and phrases, concepts. Uh, so the NPP's new definitions begin with redefining the gospel itself. N.T. Wright, who is probably the most well-known proponent of the new perspectives, writes that the gospel is not an account of how people get saved. It is the proclamation of the lordship of Jesus Christ. So for N.T. Wright and others, the gospel is Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord. Uh, so the gospel doesn't have anything directly to do with the forgiveness of sins. And because of that redefinition then, the new perspective goes on uh, to redefine terms like justification, uh, the phrase the righteousness of God and works of the law. Now since the gospel doesn't directly have anything to do with the forgiveness of sins, although that's a part of it, justification can't be God's act of declaring sinners righteous by imputing Christ's righteousness to them. Wright sees that as a legal fiction. However, that's precisely what Lutherans confess. In the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, uh, we confess to be justified means that out of unjust men, just men are made or born again. It means also that they are pronounced or accounted just or righteous. For Scripture speaks in both ways. That's AP 4. Paragraph 72. The formula of Concord also confesses, The word justify here means to declare righteous and free from sins and to absolve one from eternal punishment for the sake of Christ's righteousness, which is imputed by God to faith. Philippians 3.9 For this use and understanding of the word is common in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament. It's a solid declaration. Article 3. Paragraph 17. For right... He writes, the major context of Paul's major justification passages is not the individual search for a gracious God, but the question of how do you know who belongs to God's people? The question of justification is always bound up with the question of Israel, of the coming together of Jews and Gentiles in the Messiah. So for N.T. Wright and others, justification isn't about God's righteousness being imputed to us when we believe that Christ has atoned for our sins and earned a perfect righteousness, but rather it's about God in his righteousness declaring people to be, declaring believers in Christ to be part of God's covenant people. So for right, then, God's righteousness isn't something that can be imputed to believers. God's righteousness is simply the fact that he is and always will be faithful to his covenant promises. Because of that covenant faithfulness, God then will vindicate Israel and bestow on her the status of righteous on the last day. Elsewhere, he writes, 
Justification is not how one becomes a Christian. It is the declaration that they have become Christian. So justification declares that a person is already a Christian, which of course, he writes, means that their sins are forgiven since that was the purpose of the covenant. The forgiveness of sins, however, is generally ancillary to the gospel in the new perspectives. It's always tacked on as a byproduct or, or as an awkward appendage of the main event, which is belonging to the people of Israel, covenant membership, belonging to the right group. Faith in Christ, that he is Lord, not Caesar then, that's the badge that proclaims that one is already a member of God's covenant people. Anyone who believes that Jesus is Lord, they are part of Israel, God's covenant people. And so in this then, proponents of the NPP read works of the law in Pauline epistles as the requirements, not of the totality of the law, but specifically of Jewish ceremonial law. So to be justified by faith and not by works of the law means that Gentiles are included in God's covenant people simply by believing that Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord, who will vindicate his people on the last day. Ceremonial laws, like circumcision, uh, Sabbath observance, and dietary restrictions, uh, they were simply boundary markers. Again, badges of covenant membership prior to the time of Christ. But now that the Christ has come, those are no longer the boundary markers or the badges of covenant membership but rather faith that Jesus is Lord, and then a pious walk as a member of the covenant. That's the only badge of membership. The NPP then continues to distance itself uh, from the Lutheran understanding of Paul in that redefinition of works of the law as narrowly defining it as only works of Old Testament ceremonial law. Now, Luther explains that the ceremonial law doesn't justify uh, if, and if they don't, if those works don't justify, then neither do any works of the law, even the moral law. He, he says in his lectures on Galatians, when Paul says, as he often does, that man is not justified by the law or by works of the law, which means the same thing in Paul, he is speaking in general about the entire law. He is contrasting the righteousness of faith with the righteousness of the entire law, with everything that can be done on the basis of the law, whether by divine power or human. Since Luther sees justification as God's act by which he declares sinners not guilty for their sins and righteous because of Christ's righteousness, there isn't any room for any sort of human work whatsoever. The new perspectives reimagining, though, of Paul's situation in theology, uh, in all of this, it leads to several errors. The first is that it makes justification into an empty, empty excuse me, declaration. No, to be justified simply means that God has declared you to be in the right group, in the covenant uh, people. Uh, the sinner is forgiven somehow, but without Christ's righteousness uh, being imputed to him. And so without the imputation of Christ's righteousness, uh, the declaration that you're part of the right group doesn't really deal with the forgiveness of sins in God's sight. Uh, the sinner remains a sinner in God's sight. You know, Luther said, but to put on Christ according to the gospel is a matter not of imitation, but of a new birth and a new creation. Namely, that I put, Christ, put on Christ himself, that is, his innocence, righteousness, wisdom, power, salvation, life, and spirit. And so without the imputation of Christ's righteousness, the sinner is, he remains a sinner in God's sight. Uh, and God simply forgives them because they, be, because they belong to God's covenant people. Uh, in the end... It's rights justification that's the legal fiction. Now, this isn't surprising, considering that many pers uh, proponents of the new perspective come from uh, strains of Reformed theology that emphasize covenant and sanctification. That's the first error that the NPP leads to. The second error is one of an ecclesiastical minimalism. Uh, anyone who, uh, who acknowledges that Jesus is Lord ought to be welcome to the Lord's Supper, Wright argues. Uh, he believes uh, what matters is believing in Jesus. Detailed agreement on justification itself, properly conceived, isn't the thing which should determine Eucharistic fellowship, he writes. So Wright uses his understanding of justification by faith to argue that those who deny the Lord's Supper to other Christians, based on doctrinal disagreement, are no better than the Judaizers in Galatia, who said that the Gentiles had to go sit at a different table. 
by reimagining the gospel as the simple phrase, Jesus is Lord, uh, Wright has found a theological rationale for an ecumenism that embraces doctrinal differences and ambiguities contrary to what St. Paul taught in the very epistles that Wright seeks to interpret. The new perspectives and the Lutheran confessions, then, they're completely incompatible. Uh, in fact, many proponents of the MPP make this clear in their writings uh, when they name Luther as their contrary position that they're trying to dismantle. But in dismantling Luther's reading of Paul and redefining key vocabulary to fit their new perspective, all they're doing is accomplishing a new gospel, which is in fact not a gospel at all, and is ambiguous at best, and therefore no good to anybody. So that's the new perspectives on Paul. Thanks for asking. We'll catch you next time on ATP.